answer any question you may have. So uh, again, we have um, a chat for, uh, for Q&A uh, during this session. And we also have the Slack channel that we're monitoring. I'm gonna uh, paste the link in the chat soon uh, so that you can also join the Slack channel. So with this, uh, I'll leave the floor to Sheta to present how you can deploy a, a 5GNR standalone network inside Colosseum. Hello, everyone. My name is Shweta Srivastava, and I lead the Open Air Interface 5G development and testing effort at Open Air X Labs at Northeastern University. In this presentation, I will talk about and demonstrate how to deploy open air interface end-to-end -end in 5G standalone mode over Colosseum testbed. I will show some throughput numbers and will also demo multiple UV support. This session will cover a lot of details, so please utilize the chat feature to ask your questions and we will answer them as we go. A quick introduction to OpenAirX Labs. OpenAirX Labs is a lab system incubated within the Institute for Wireless Internet of Things at Northeastern University. This is part of the Platforms for Advanced Wireless Research, or the POWER program. It is funded by NSF and US uh, Department of Defense's Office of the Undersecretary of Defense. OAX Labs is supported by Open Air Interface Software Alliance Board as the official North American designate affiliate development partner. And OX Labs basically uh, serves as the North American home for development, testing, and integration of OAI 5G standalone mode software stack, with the goal to provide a benchmark end-to-end -end 5G standalone reference architecture to be used for various 5G research projects by industry, academia, and government. As part of the charter, we undertake several activities. Since OAI Software Alliance's focus has been on performing interoperability testing of OAI GNOB with COTS UE, we have kept our focus on delivering a stable and feature-rich OAI NR UE to enable standalone mode deployment over STR-based testbeds. Colosseum is one such testbed we have here. We work very closely with Eurecom and other Alliance members to develop new features and contribute them into OAI code base. Some features we have developed include dynamic scheduling on the uplink, uplink resource allocation improvements, scheduling request buffer status support, and others. A very important part of our contribution has been to improve the stability of OAI UE by debugging and resolving several errors and failures at the UE. And the process includes very extensive testing. We resolve issues with multiple UE support, and we work closely with Eurecom to improve throughput to 8 Mbps in the downlink and 3.5 Mbps in the uplink. In addition, we also set up a CICD system for open air interface here at Northeastern University to provide additional resources in the form of hardware and test benches for OAI testing and ensure the code stability. We have been testing uh, OAI over multiple test platforms. Um, these include two large-scale test beds housed at Northeastern University. First is Colosseum, which is part of the power program. It is a large-scale wireless test bed um, and uses a massive channel emulator. I will um, talk more about Colosseum uh, in a little bit. Um, Arena is the other in-house test bed we have, which has Intel Xeon servers, X310 and N210 USRPs, and a 64 antenna grid to perform transmissions over the air. In addition to the test beds at Northeastern, we are working uh, very closely with the Power Airport teams to conduct testing on two separate test pinches, uh, one at uh, North Carolina State University and the other at Mississippi State University. The test bench at NCSU includes a Keysight PropSim channel emulator to emulate complex uh, channel conditions. It also includes a Quartz UE module by Quectel. The MSU test bench uses X310 STRs and performs transmissions over the air. In addition to these, there are parallel testing efforts being conducted by several of our partners, including the Powder team at Utah. Um, 
here's a quick overview of the Colosseum test bed. Um, some of you may be familiar with it or you might have heard about it in the previous sessions, but Colosseum is basically a massive wireless systems test bed, uh, which is housed at Northeastern University. Um, it, is, uh, it was developed by DARPA and is funded by the National Science Foundation. Um, it's again a large scale test bed with 128 Intel Xeon based compute servers, each connected to a software defined programmable radio. Um, and it has a massive channel emulator which provides real time emulation uh, with complex RF scenarios. Um, it is remotely accessible and is used for a variety of uh, uh, experiments uh, by the research community. Um, a little bit about how we run experiments in Colosseum. So all user experiments in Colosseum are run in NXC containers, as these are lightweight um, and yet provide some benefits of virtual machines. They also provide bare metal access um, to the hardware. Um, Colosseum provides um, some base Ubuntu containers. Um, users can use one of these base containers to install software and libraries they need for their experiments. Um, they can configure the containers um, as needed to create their custom container. These containers are loaded for them on the Colosseum host or what we call SRNs at the time of their Colosseum reservation. Um, and then uh, they can log into these SRNs to run their experiments. Um, we also provide two pre-configured uh, open air interface containers for Colosseum users. Uh, which users can use to run their experiments um, or uh, they can be used as starting points to uh, make uh, uh, customizations uh, by users um, and uh, they can customize the configuration um, or the code itself. Um, I will be using these containers for our demo today but I'll also walk you through the configurations uh, present in these uh, containers. Um, the slide here shows the names of the two containers um, that uh, you can access uh, while making a reservation on Colosseum. Um, and uh, I've provided some links which will provide you more detail on uh, how to create these custom Colosseum containers. Um, before going into the demos, I would like to provide you a quick overview of the OAI RAN code. Uh, mainly the directories and how the code is structured. On the left here, you can see the open air interface code and directory structure. The readme file also provides some overview of this directory structure. In terms of the source code, um, executable folders provides the top level executable source files. And our soft modem.c um, is the entry point for the G node B, and then our UE soft modem.c uh, is for the UE. The main 5G software stack uh, is provided in these uh, three folders OpenAir 1, 2, and 3. OpenAir 1 is primarily a uh, file related code. Um, you can see here uh, there's functionality related to coding, modulation, and so on. Um, there's um, uh, some scheduling related code uh, pertaining to the file. One point I want to mention is that the uh, NR prefix or suffix is usually associated with 5G G node B code and then NRUE is uh, basically the NRUE. Uh, so typically all others uh, would be 4G code. OpenAir 2 is Mac and higher layers. Um, so if you look in the layer two, you can see GNODE B Mac code, UE Mac code, some common code as well. Then there's um, PDCP and RLC um, here. And then you will see the RRC code here. So GNODE B RRC and NRUE RRC, STAP as well. And then in OpenAir 3, you will find uh, all the code that pertains to um, communicating with the core network. So you see um, NAS and uh, NGAP and so on over here. Um, there's also this uh, targets uh, directory. Um, this basically contains all the real-time um, code related to uh, the hardware. For example, the USRP uh, wrapper uh, code is here. 
Also, um, the RF simulator uh, code is um, here as well. Um, another folder I want to point out quickly is CMake targets. This is where all the build files are. And build away is the script uh, that we use to build uh, the GNOME B and UE. And uh, I'll, I'll um, go over the usage of this um, later. Um, so I hope that provides a high level uh, overview of the code. This line depicts the typical configuration we use to deploy OAI in standalone mode. The core network runs in Docker containers while GNOME B and UE uh, run on bare metal. Um, here we use um, two hosts uh, and we run the GNOME B and core network on the same host. Um, I recommend using separate hosts for GNOME B um, and uh, core network as we'll see in the next slide for Colosseum. These 5G components are running in a Docker container uh, and they run on a separate Docker network that is uh, created here uh, with this um, IP range. The components here include um, AMF, SMF, UPF, uh, and NRF. OAI has recently released um, uh, new core network functions as well, which we plan to deploy and test on Colosseum over the next few weeks. The GNOME B is uh, running on bare metal here on server one, and UE is running on bare metal on server two. Um, the GNOME B and UE communicate uh, via USRPs. Um, we typically use X310 in our setups. Um, N310s can be used as well. And the communication channel between them um, uh, could be channel emulator or the transmissions uh, could be over the air. This OAI XDN container here is only for demo purposes and helps um, exchange uh, user plane traffic uh, with the UE. Um, this slide depicts the configuration we use to deploy OAI over Colosseum. It is very similar to the previous configuration, um, but some differences are that uh, the GNOME B and um, UE uh, run within LXC containers as opposed to bare metal. And even the core network Docker containers run within LXC containers. We had to make some tweaks to the Docker Compose configuration to make this work, which I'll talk about a little later. And we also do not use the OAI EXTDN container here, and we transfer traffic directly from the host. As the core network and GNOME B are running on separate hosts, um, they communicate via this Ethernet interface. Um, and this is a call zero interface, specifically uh, in Colosseum. And uh, uh, Colosseum uses this massive channel emulator. And in our case, we basically uh, use a simple zero dB path loss scenario. I'm going to now show you an overview of how I deployed and configured OAI 5G core network on Colosseum. I'll be using pre-configured containers, uh, but I'll be uh, walking over the steps of the configuration. Um, I have also created a couple of guides that include uh, all the steps um, that I'll be um, showing you today. And the links to those uh, guides have been included on the last slide of this presentation. And also please uh, use the chat uh, feature if you have any questions. Here I am connected to a Colosseum SRN. This SRN has the OAI 5G CN image um, loaded onto it, uh, which I specified uh, when I was uh, making this Colosseum reservation. Um, and this is uh, the image uh, that is basically the OAI 5G core network image. In this, I um, have already um, installed all the prerequisites for the core network. Um, also, I have downloaded the core network images from Docker Hub. So as you can see, uh, when I run Docker images, we have the AMF, NRF, um, SMF, um, and UPF um, in, um, images here, as well as um, the MySQL uh, that will be used for the database. We have um, these directories here. So the main one, uh, which we will use uh, for um, configuring the, and running the core network uh, is OAI CN 5G pet. 
OAI Core Network uses Docker Compose for deploying these containers. So we will go into the Docker Compose directory. And there are a few different files here. First thing we need to look at is the OAI db.sql file. Um, as you can see in this file, um, <clears throat> um, various MZ values have been added, uh, which will be part of the OAI core network database once the core network um, is running. The MZ that the OAI UE uses by default um, is this one here. Um, and uh, when we run multiple UEs, um, we can use uh, different values uh, for the MZ while we are running the OAI UE. Um, and for that purpose, I have added um, three more MZ values here. The other file we are going to look at is uh, the docker compose.yaml file. This file basically provides the configuration for all these uh, different containers. And when these containers are run, um, these, this configuration uh, will be copied into the container. Um, for the OAI MF, um, we need to ensure um, that the MNC value uh, we are using is um, 99. Um, the other reason is that um, OAI UE by default uses uh, this MNC value. Um, so we usually uh, update it um, everywhere, wherever uh, we see uh, the MNC number. So you can see I've updated, updated all of these values to 99. Um, another thing that we need to note is um, the PLN support tag, um, which here we see 0xA000. This is what we will need to update in the GNOME config file as well. Um, finally, we need to make sure that the SST and SD values are set to one and one, um, at least for one of the cases. So we see a different set of values here, but we see uh, one and one here. Um, this again it, uh, are the default values used by the OAI UE. Um, yeah, besides that, um, uh, we need to um, set this um, operator key, which is um, uh, what is um, used uh, by the core network for the authentication of this UE. And we did make some changes uh, for the um, UPF, which is the, um, the OAISP gateway uh, container. Um, basically, um, this by default, this container runs as a privileged container, uh, which is not possible. Um, in this case, because um, the LXC container that we are running on Colosseum is not a privileged container. Um, and it's not possible to run a privileged Docker container within an unprivileged LXC container. So to get around that, we remove the privilege um, for uh, this container. Um, and we added uh, some um, additional capabilities, um, including uh, these capabilities um, that you see here. And um, also the these CTLs here. By adding these, we are able to get around the need to run um, this as a privileged container. And um, another change that I also mentioned earlier was to um, eliminate uh, the OAI EXTDN container. Um, this again needs to run as a privileged container, um, as you can see here. Uh, which again is not possible, uh, but since this uh, container was only for demo purposes, we don't really need it here. So we eliminate that here. So we can now uh, go ahead and run the core network functions. For uh, uh, starting them, uh, we have the script here, core network um, dot sh. So we will run this script and the options that we provide it are um, start for uh, starting the core network NRF because we are using the NRF in this case um, and, um, and uh, uh, SP gateway U. So when I press enter, um, you can see that it creates, uh, creates this network and then it will go ahead and start these functions. One more thing that I'm going to do is I am going to run Wireshark so I can 
see the messages exchanged between the core network and the genome B or UV. So you can see this demo OAI interface uh, is showing up here. So we click on that and we can see here all the messages exchanged between the different core network components. And if we go here, we see that the core network has is already started. And if I do a Docker PS, I can see that um, all the components are started um, and healthy. I've opened another terminal here, uh, and here I am logged into um, another SRN, which will uh, run the G node B. Uh, we have uh, this um, image um, loaded here, uh, which is basically um, the RAN image. If we look at um, the directory structure, uh, we have uh, different scripts and directories here. Um, this is where the OpenAir interface code has been cloned. So if we go into this directory, uh, we can see the same directory structure that we um, saw earlier. Um, and if you remember, we do the builds from the CMake targets directory um, and the build script is um, right here, the build OAI script. Um, so if I run build OAI dash dash help, then it will show me all the different options that are available uh, for uh, building. Um, uh, I'll just go over a few of um, the important ones. Um, um, this, uh, these uh, minus uh, C lowercase and uppercase um, allow you to clean the builds uh, if you want to do a build from scratch. Uh, the dash, uh, dash uppercase I option installs all the required packages and dependencies uh, for OAI. Uh, this is typically used when we are installing or building OAI for uh, the first time um, on a given machine and uh, the dependencies um, do not um, already exist. Um, a caveat for Colosseum is that uh, when you use the dash I option, um, it's some, uh, it, there may be some conflicts. It installs um, uh, certain packages which may not be compatible uh, with Colosseum, for example, the UHD driver. So for Colosseum, I recommend starting with this image as uh, the base image um, and checking out um, any other version of the code that you want and, and then uh, building on top of it. Since we already have all the required packages here, uh, you can skip the dash I option. Uh, if you do use the dash I option, there is a risk of um, a wrong version of the packages being installed. Um, so the other, uh, options that we will be using are uh, the dash dash NRUE um, and dash dash G node B, uh, which will help us build NRUE um, and G node B. Besides that, um, another helpful option is um, uh, the dash P option, which helps you build the five simulators if you plan to use that. Um, and then one more option is uh, the build lib option. Um, and we be use build lib with NR scope option. And NR scope is very useful uh, for checking uh, the phi uh, signals and constellations and so on. For building the G node B e and UE, we also um, use one more option, which is the dash W option, which basically lets us specify um, the hardware that we use, which in our case um, is USRP. So we will, we will use this command to build the G node B um, and the UE. Since I have already uh, built uh, these, I will uh, skip this command. This will should typically uh, take five to 10 minutes, depending on the configuration of your system. Once the build is complete, you will find the uh, build libraries and executables in this directory. Um, you can see um, all the libraries and executables present here. Um, the two we will use are the NR soft modem, which is the G node P executable, and NR UE soft modem, which is the UE executable. There's also this readme file, which provides um, some details about what the different uh, scripts are for. I'll also go over these details right now. 
Um, the first thing I'm going to do is open the GNODB configuration file so we can look at uh, the configuration. So this is the configuration file we use. This is configured for uh, band 78 with 106 PRBs um, and, and it works uh, for um, um, any of the USRPs. So there's not a lot that we have to um, change in this configuration file, a uh, few things. The first thing uh, we need to ensure is um, the tracking area code. Uh, this should match the one in the Docker Compose file on the core network that we saw earlier. And I'm gonna open it again. And um, you can see that you have this number um, uh, here matches uh, matches this value. Uh, the uh, MCC and MNC of 208 and 99, uh, which we saw earlier, these values need to match. And then the SST um, and ST, which um, is this one. Um, and this has to be at least one set, which is both set to one, um, which we have here as well. So these, these um, are the main configuration here. A uh, few other things that um, we need to include here. One is the SDR address. So we need to uh, specify the IP address of the SDR if it's connected via the ethernet. Um, also, OAI highly recommends using an external clock source. Um, so if you are using that, um, you can uh, use uh, these parameters to specify the clock source as external. Um, another parameter uh, to keep in mind is the Rx gain. Um, this, uh, we have seen this uh, affecting um, the reception um, and uh, the value that has worked for us uh, is usually 114, um, 110 to 114 has worked well. Um, so yeah, you can now uh, uh, ensure that um, the value is uh, set correctly. Before going into the next configuration, I just wanted to remind you of uh, this call zero interface on the, these two SRNs, one and two, the one running uh, the core network um, and the one running the GNODB. Um, call zero interface on SRN2 is what the GNODB binds to. So the GNODB uh, needs to know um, the IP address of this. Um, also, the GNODB needs to be able to find this Docker container. So it may, we need to set a route on this host uh, pointing um, towards this via this call zero interface uh, on SRN1. So going back here, Let's check the call zero interface. Um, so we can see that the IP address of uh, the call zero uh, interface here is this. So we go back to the configuration file. And we have to ensure that um, the interface names for um, these two values is set to call zero and then that the IP, that this IP address um, is set to uh, the correct value for this host, um, which I need to update. And I'll do the same here. So that completes our GNODB configuration. Regarding setting the route towards uh, the core network, so we check the call zero interface on the host running the core network. Um, and you can see that this is the IP address of this call zero interface. So we will add the route towards the network which is hosting the Docker images. And these are identified by um, this network address. The gateway is the IP address of the call zero interface of the other host. So we set that out um, here. And we should now be able to reach the demo OAI interface on the other um, post. Now, if you are using this pre-configured container on Colossium, 
um, I want to show you um, this script. I say gnode b run dot shell, which is used to run the gnode b. In addition to running the gnode b, this script also automatically takes care of setting uh, the route towards the core network, which we just did manually. In addition, it also takes care of setting the IP address of call zero interface in the gnode b config file, which we again did manually just now. Um, so if you are using this pre-configured container, uh, you do not need to um, do that IP configuration or setting the route, the script will take care of it. And then the script also goes ahead and runs the gnode b. Um, this is the executable, if you remember, and then minus O option specifies the config file. And another important option is this, which specifies standalone mode. Um, there's uh, other commands commented out here. Um, these are uh, to be used if you want to use the file scope. So I will go ahead and run the G node B now. And before that, I will um, also um, introduce a filter here so that we only see the messages exchanged between the G node B or UE with the core network and not all these other messages. So now when I run the core network, I should see um, these messages here. So basically Gene would be exchanges this ng setup request and response messages with the core network. And successfully connects with the core network. I have opened another terminal um, to another SRN here uh, where we will run the NRUE. For uh, running the NRUE, we do not um, need a lot of changes. This is the script um, that is um, present on these containers, which we can use to run the NRUE. If I open the script, um, you can uh, see that this is uh, running um, this executable from this directory that we saw earlier. There are a few command line options. Uh, this option basically parallelizes the DLSCH decoding process and um, improves the efficiency. Um, this specifies that this is standalone mode. This option is useful for specifying the NZ uh, to be used by the NRUE. This is very useful when we run multiple UEs and we need to specify a different NZ for each UE. Then we specify the USRP IP address, the numerology, number of resource blocks, band 78, the frequency, um, the no kernel mode. Uh, the TX gain of zero is also very important because we have seen um, issues with uh, um, TX and RX when we don't send the games properly. Another important parameter that is used primarily in Colossian is the stash A option, which basically specifies an initial timing advance. Colossian introduces uh, some delays because of the processing done by the massive channel emulator, um, because of which we uh, have to specify um, this timing advance to compensate for that delay. In this case, it's 2,539 samples, which we have uh, found um, by a trial and error. In most other test benches um, where there are not any additional delays, OAI should automatically be able to converge to the right timing advance values. So this option is not needed in other test beds. And then we specify uh, the clock source and time source and value of one means that it's um, external. Before we start uh, the UE, there is one more thing we need to do. In Colosseum, um, there are um, certain RF scenarios and we need um, to run an RF scenario uh, before we can uh, enable any communication uh, via the channel emulator. To run these RF scenario, we use this command and we specify the scenario number. In case of OAI, we use uh, the scenario 10011 because this runs at 3.62 gigahertz, which is uh, what uh, the default frequency 
uh, is, which is used by OAI. And minus C option just cycles this scenario to run over and over again. Once we start the scenario, we can now run the NR UE and it should basically um, run and be able to um, find the GNode B. It will start the random access procedure and the RRC setup procedure. And then it will go ahead and establish a connection with the core network. As you can see here, it, it uh, sends the registration request, it performs the authentication, the capability exchange, and finally it goes ahead and establishes uh, the PDU session uh, with the... And we can see here that after the PDU session establishment is successful, this UE is assigned an IP address by the core network. So one thing we need to do before we can start exchanging user plane traffic is to set a default route at this host. And this default route is via the UPF. This is the IP address of the UPF. And this is basically the other um, uh, endpoint of the tunnel that uh, the UPF creates uh, with this UE. We also need to add a route at the core network host for it to be able to find um, the network on which the UE is, uh, which is uh, this network. And um, it can access this via the UPF uh, IP address. So this is the other end of the UPF um, towards the core network. So once these routes are added, we'll see that we can reach the core network and the uh, UE from each other. So in order to ping the host to running the core network from the UE, we will use the PR0 interface. This interface is typically used for um, sending out um, traffic in Colosseum. And uh, you can see that we can uh, reach that interface from the UE as well. So I'll run iPerf to do some throughput testing. Um, on the UE side, I am running the iPerf server. And on the Core network side, I will run the iPerf client. Right now I'm running traffic at one Mbps. Um, and we can see that uh, we get a consistent bandwidth or throughput of one Mbps. In our um, experiments, we found that uh, we are able to reach up to eight Mbps currently. Um, and uh, it runs stably with this value. So I'm going to try 8 Mbps uh, for this run. And we can see that we, we um, achieve uh, throughput of 8 Mbps on the downlink. I will now run iperf on the uplink. So I start the iperf server on the core network host and I start the iperf client at the UE side, and I will run at one Mbps first. Here we can see that um, the throughput on an average is uh, close to one Mbps. Um, it fluctuates a little more on the uplink as compared to downlink. Um, so we have been able to achieve a maximum throughput of about 3 Mbps on the uplink in Colosseum. So I'm going to try 3 Mbps now. And again, the throughput fluctuates a little on the uplink. Um, and on an average, we get about 2.5 to 3 Mbps um, in every run. So I hope that gives uh, a picture of the throughput that we can achieve uh, 
uh, with uh, open air interface in end to end standalone mode. Next, we will demo multiple UE support in open air interface. Multi UE setup and configuration is very really similar to single UE configuration. I show two UEs on this slide, but in the demo, I'll use six SRNs, uh, four of them running UEs, and I'll show all four connecting to the core network and receiving data traffic. So I have um, opened three more terminals to three other SRNs here. We um, have the core network already running here. Um, and uh, we were running the G B. And there was one SRN where we were, we were already running the UE. So now in the next SRN, um, if you look at the scripts, uh, we basically have multiple scripts to run the UE, including um, this, is, this is the one, and then we have an RUE1 run.shell, SANRUE2 run.shell, and SANRUE3 run.shell. Um, and the only difference between these scripts is that they are using different MZ values each. So yeah, you can see here that I'm specifying the MZ value um, in this command line. Um, this is different from uh, what we used for this one. Similarly, the other two uh, scripts use different MZ values. And if you remember, we added these uh, MZ values to the core network uh, database uh, in the beginning. So now I can simply start the second UE, and we will be able to see um, the packets exchanged in Wireshark. So you can see this UE also uh, completed um, the connection procedure with the core network and established a PDU session. And it should have been assigned an IP address, which is right here. Similarly, we can go ahead and start the other two UEs as well. And we should see them completing the control plane procedure successfully. And as you can see, this um, third UE completed the procedures and Established a PDU session, and I'm going to start the fourth UE. In the meantime, we can check the IP address assigned to this third UE, uh, which is this. And then the final UE also successfully goes through the uh, PDU session establishment. And we can check the IP address assigned to it. And um, all, all these UEs are now successfully connected. I will now try simultaneous iperf in the downlink. So I have iperf servers running on all the four UEs. And I will now start iperf clients, um, which will connect to um, each of the UEs. Uh, from the core network host um, and um, send data at uh, 0.5 Mbps. Um, so let's um, start these clients and these should connect. And we can see that all, all these hosts are comfortably getting 500 kilobits per second. I will now uh, uh, try iperf at 2 Mbps uh, for each of um, the UEs. Um, since we were getting 8 Mbps on the downlink, um, this should be okay. And as we can see, all, all the UEs are, are 
getting a bandwidth of um, or a throughput of 2 Mbps pretty much comfortably. Um, there's some packet loss in some places. That concludes the demo. Here are the links to the documents that I mentioned in the talk. Thank you. All right. Uh, thanks, Shreta, for the uh, fantastic tutorial. And uh, I think it really helped us understand how uh, uh, OAI and the 5G standalone configuration can be used in Colosseum, which is, uh, as we discussed yesterday, is a tool that can be used for uh, many different software-defined uh, applications. Um, so um, 